Hello, everyone. This is Karen O'Hara. I'm the Director of Marketing and Communications with WorkCare. Thank you for joining us today on such short notice for the first in our weekly series of webinars on preventing and managing COVID-19 in the workplace. I know we're all really scrambling to try to do the best job we can in preventing further spread of disease. And um, we hope this session will be informative for you. Just a couple of housekeeping um, measures before we get started. The webinar is being recorded and we will be redistributing the recording uh, within the next 24 hours along with an invitation to anyone who hasn't signed up for the webinar so they can be on the schedule for next which uh, will be repeated on the same schedule at the same time on the same day until we don't need to do these anymore. Our speaker today is Anthony Harris, MD, MPH, MBA. Dr. Harris is a board certified occupational medicine physician and he's been one of our lead point people at WorkCare for management of the COVID-19 health emergency. In the interest of time, we're gonna limit the session to 30 minutes. Please submit your questions using the Q&A tab at the bottom of the screen. Any questions we can't get to, please submit them to Alexis Lupo, who sent out the original email inviting you to the webinar, and she'll make sure we get our subject matter experts to answer those questions, and then we'll redistribute them to all registrants. So now I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Harris. Excellent. Thank you, Karen. Uh, hopefully everyone can hear me okay. Uh, send us a uh, chat if you can't. Um, but we'll go ahead and get started today. And um, again, this will be one of a series that we do on a weekly basis. And the goal of it is to keep everyone uh, up to date and on um, on the same page with regard to uh, best practices. Uh, so what you will hear um, today is uh, talking about uh, the impact uh, of coronavirus from a clinical standpoint, um, from a uh, epidemiological pathology, and then we'll talk about prevention and uh, appropriate corporate responses. Um, and this will be, again, focused on those primary areas as we continue to evolve our knowledge base. Uh, however, um, we're not going to focus in on kind of governmental responses and uh, news bites, if you would. Uh, obviously, we're being inundated day to day by those type of uh, media uh, outputs. And the goal of this uh, endeavor is to really focus in on uh, what matters, uh, what are the facts, and what do we do about it. And so with that being said, we'll go ahead and, and jump into it. And again, we're going to cover clinical presentation first. We'll talk a little bit about the pathology so that everyone is clear about what type of disease this is, um, the historical climb of this disease from an epidemiologic standpoint, prevention, and then finally corporate response and screening. So uh, the clinical presentation is uh, what you've seen, uh, I'm sure, so far. Um, it's a uh, nonspecific presentation with cough, fever, chest tightness, and shortness of breath. Now, uh, the number one uh, presentation is fever in order, right? Uh, but those are the top four um, that individuals have presented with. And the incubation period officially is two to 14 days. Most individuals present within 11 and a half days. And so the 14 days gives us a little cushion on that. Uh, there has been one or two studies that have pointed towards an incubation period of 27 days, um, but those involve um, a potential double exposure situation and not the norm. So again, um, far and away, the incubation period known to date uh, is up to 14 days. And when we talk about those individuals that have predisposed risk, where it's clear that this uh, disease is affecting disproportionately the older population, 65 and older, um, those who have underlying conditions such as diabetes, heart disease, lung disease are at risk as well. Uh, and they have special recommendations regarding prevention we'll talk about later. But the average age of mortality for this particular disease uh, is 80, 80 years. 
of age, okay? And if we look at that more specifically across the uh, um, data that we have from China, um, by far and away, um, the uh, those who uh, succumb to this uh, have been over the age of 80, 14.8% uh, of those age 80 who contract the disease um, uh, do succumb to it. And that was, again, data from China. And we're seeing that mirrored uh, across Italy and other areas of um, wi widespread sustained disease. When we talk about additional exposure risks specifically, again, uh, in, the, in the general population, uh, otherwise healthy individuals, the uh, rate of contraction from exposure is low. Okay, uh, and the uh, elevated risk is when we talk about uh, those areas specific to ongoing sustained uh, communicate or sustained uh, spread, and th that's most likely going to be demarcated by your county. Uh, and uh, local, that's what local health officials are responding to. The elevated risk for close contacts, we'll talk about a little bit more, but again, it's close contacts specifically defined by CDC on WHO as uh, having close contact with an individual that is positive for COVID, not somebody who is um, uh, merely symptomatic with uh, upper respiratory symptoms, but an actual confirmed case of COVID-19. And if we look at the countries that are affected, obviously that list is growing vastly, and, um, but the focus should be on countries also that have uh, increased sustained community spread. And those countries are listed here. And so travel obviously has been limited from these countries and to the US. Uh, and again, that number does continue to grow. When we talk about the pathology of the disease, again, so we're on the right page here, uh, this is a pneumonia we're dealing with. And uh, the pneumonia is classic in its presentation from a clinical standpoint. Uh, you see uh, depicted here on the bottom right, uh, a CT image of the lungs of an individual that uh, had uh, COVID-19. And those whitish areas you're seeing on the outsides of the lungs there uh, are indicative of pneumonia. And so it's uh, exactly what we would see with community acquired pneumonia. Uh, but this is how clinicians monitor uh, the condition of an individual that has been hospitalized uh, for this particular disease. Uh, and oftentimes individuals require um, uh, oxygen supplementation or even put on ventilators. And that's what's driving a lot of the um, bottlenecking in, in, in uh, Italy. Uh, there's only about 70,000 resp uh, respirators in the country, right? And so if everyone is contracting in that older age range uh, and needing support, it's difficult to uh, um, have the appropriate resources uh, to, to uh, address all that level of disease. And so that's why we're really focused in on prevention that we'll talk about in a bit here. From an epidemiologic standpoint, uh, it's important to talk about the virus and its origins, just so to, there's no confusion there. Uh, obviously, it did originate in Wuhan, China. Uh, human contacts with bats is how uh, we've narrowed down genetically the uh, particular strain of uh, this SARS uh, disease and virus. Uh, and it's very similar to what we saw back in 2003, 2005. And uh, particularly the sequencing that occurred in 2005 is what we referenced uh, to compare with um, the uh, current COVID-19 disease. Uh, and the viruses exploit a similar pathway. And so what that means is that uh, there is a significant uh, um, report of uh, immu immu immuno um, uh, competence, if you would, or uh, resistance um, to this current uh, uh, COVID-19 um, cross crossing with the previous disease. So if you were immune to SARS um, back in 2003, uh, then there's an 85, 80 to 85% chance you're going to be immune to SARS uh, uh, COVID-2 right now. And so this is what researchers are exploiting with regard to vaccines. Uh, and indeed, uh, the, the uh, two vaccines that have been tested and showing positive, um, positive results uh, are HIV antivirals that have been widely accepted and used for the treatment of HIV. And there's been some early successes 
uh, and, and also an anti-malarial uh, drug, chloroquine, has been com uh, combined with that anti-HIV. Uh, and again, these are under study currently. So if we look at transmission, uh, obviously we're dealing with now person-to-person -person contact. Let's be clear about that. The early thoughts on how this was transmitted um, was not uh, um, of high virility, meaning that it was person-to-person -person back in uh, December and early January. It's clear now we have sustained, uh, in certain communities in the U.S., sustained person-to-person -person, uh, contact that's widespread, uh, communication that's widespread. And so when we look at the importance of uh, how we can do prevention, we have to understand whether this virus uh, can survive uh, as long as uh, of the original SARS that we saw back in 2003. And indeed, uh, if we look at some of the early published, uh, and again, this is published data that is published in uh, the New England Journal of uh, Medicine, um, but it's as a uh, commentary, uh, but not, in, uh, and it's still undergoing uh, additional peer review. But uh, the researchers from NIH and uh, from Princeton have shown that uh, SARS, uh, this SARS uh, causing COVID-19 can last up to three hours uh, in the air aerosolized, up to four hours on items like copper, 24 hours on cardboard, and up to two to three days on plastics like polypropylene and stainless steel. So it is important as we talk about uh, precautions and prevention to do uh, sanitizing, uh, and that's why the CDC has come out with those recent, uh, and, and recent metrics on how we sterilize. Briefly, uh, just looking at uh, the cases back on March of this year, March 9th of this year, the number of deaths in the U.S. was uh, 19, and or excuse me, the total cases 423, total deaths 19. Uh, the travel related were 72, meaning persons that came uh, and brought the disease with them, and then person to person contact was low, 29, uh, and under investigation 322. So these numbers have ballooned uh, since then. Uh, and if we look at the map today, as of this morning, uh, all 50 states are reporting uh, infection, okay? Uh, and those hit hardest, obviously, Washington, California, New York. Uh, and so uh, when we talk about precautions, we want to make sure that uh, we are paying attention to local health, uh, um, county, uh, and state local uh, advice in regards to is the disease widespread and sustained in your local community? Uh, and if we look at total deaths now, we're talking uh, 117 total cases, uh, 7,636. Let's look at a couple epidemi epidemiologic trends um, uh, that has happened uh, since the beginning of this in China. And if we look across worldwide cases, total confirmed COVID cases, uh, by far and away, it tracked along with China up until um, uh, mid to mid mid February, and then China uh, began to level off. And this curve, called an S curve, is a classic curve from an epi standpoint. Uh, and if you look at where the curve uh, ha starts to uh, uh, decrease, uh, that is an important uh, area, and I'll highlight that here um, uh, real quick. Uh, so the area that you're seeing uh, here denotes a decline in the daily new cases. And this is uh, where we recognize that China was uh, turning the tide with regard to spread of COVID-19. If you compare it to the U.S., again, we're, we're very low in total cases. However, uh, it's important to note that uh, the majority of cases still uh, have presented in China. If we look at other uh, nationalities, Italy, uh, South Korea, uh, Iran, uh, along with China and the U.S., uh, again, uh, China mapped very uh, uh, closely that and represented most of the world's uh, population for confirmed cases of COVID-19. And if we look at confirmed deaths, this uh, data uh, was from March 11, as opposed to this morning, uh, but still uh, the tracings were very uh, similar with China leading uh, in terms of number of deaths and the number of deaths in Italy obviously growing. Uh, and there's a doubling uh, of uh, these cases uh, more, from a mortality standpoint in each of the countries. And that doubling time ranges uh, from as little as five days uh, to up to 12 days for the num total number of deaths to double uh, every five to 12 days, okay? And so that's an important 
uh, metric that we're continuing to watch. But again, those deaths um, uh, over uh, uh, almost 90% are occurring in those age 70 or older. If we look at total new daily confirmed cases, again, looking at uh, the data from March 11th, uh, it, it mapped again uh, China. And so now that China is on the decline with new cases, uh, we're paying attention to Italy, obviously United States, we're uh, uh, taking measures to prevent spread. And we'll talk about the importance of why we're so adamant about uh, social distancing uh, and, and trying to turn the tide here. So uh, this is some sobering data in terms of testing uh, worldwide. If we look at testing worldwide, who has done, what country has done the most testing? It's clear far and away China, followed by South Korea, Italy. Uh, the US is down at number seven, right? And so uh, there has been a bottleneck at getting appropriate tests um, performed here. And we wanna um, make sure that uh, we, we continue to pay attention, not just to the total number of tests, but the actual number of tests per million. Because if we look at this metric, uh, the United States drops all the way down uh, towards the tail end, uh, meaning that uh, we're, we're not testing per uh, population as frequent as other countries, right? And if we look at this another way, we can see that uh, the US falls uh, right in the middle in terms of number of tests performed per million, uh, versus total number of confirmed COVID cases. And so what does that uh, give us insight to? That helps us understand to what extent we're underrepresenting the number of cases in the US with our current data, right? We, we talked about that number being 7,600 roughly, um, but we've only uh, um, uh, begun to test about half as many of the other countries in terms of number of our population. And so, for instance, Italy has much higher cases, but they've also tested a far greater number of individuals uh, per capita. So we have some grounds to make up, and that's why you're seeing the scramble now to get uh, adequate testing uh, performed so we can better track who and who, what, what communities have sustained transmission. Let's do a quick historical comparison so that it brings kind of uh, a, a good um, reflectiveness to SARS in 2003 versus what we're dealing with now. Uh, first reported case back in 2003 was March 14th. Uh, the first reported death was 44 days later on April 27th. Um, we don't have the accurate data comparison uh, for SARS dealing with now because uh, it's been convoluted from the uh, data from China. However, uh, if we look at the case uh, fatality or mortality rate, um, they're close. And in fact, 3.8 was uh, SARS back in 2003. We're uh, around 3.55 right now, looking at uh, total number of deaths versus total cases. Now, this number in some uh, studies has been uh, shown to be underrepresented of the total number of deaths, uh, it may be as high as five or five and a half percent uh, if you look at uh, some different metrics regarding uh, that reporting piece that I talked about earlier. Um, but specifically going back to 2003, the peak mortality rate ballooned to 45 percent uh, and then stabilized to 15 percent um, by time the uh, epidemic uh, was, was uh, tailing off. Right, and so we uh, are paying attention closely to see how uh, SARS-CoV-2 uh, is going to mirror this uh, ballooning, and that's what we're trying to prevent with the drastic measures that we've taken uh, across the country. When we talk about prevention, uh, it is what you all have heard and have known to be best practice hygiene, 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 right? Frequent washing of the hands with soap and water for 20 seconds. Use sanitizer if you don't have uh, soap and water available. Uh, cough and sneeze hygiene, uh, respiratory hygiene where you're uh, not coughing in, into the air, uh, aerosolizing. Uh, one particular thing to note, uh, when you're drying your hands, use a paper towel and dispose of it in a touchless receptacle if possible. Try to stay away from, and you can counsel your uh, um, uh, employer employees with this, uh, try not to use uh, hand dryers, air dryers. There has been uh, some evidence to suggest that while hand dryers are good for limiting bacterial spread, uh, because bacteria are heavier than viruses, uh, viruses can be aerosolized by the hair, uh, by the air hand dryers. 
Uh, so try to use paper towels uh, when available and dispose of them right away. Avoid touching your face. Try not to use uh, um, uh, um, you know, greetings that are touching. And you want to, we'll talk about social distancing here in a second. But even at home, you want to disinfect surfaces frequently um, as well. So when we look at uh, the overall trend that we're trying to prevent with the measures that we've taken with social distancing and limiting travel, um, this is a clear depiction of what an outbreak would look like uh, if there were no uh, pandemic, if there were no measures to limit how we move about in, in the US in general, right? And it's a sustained community spread that allows the virus uh, to spread very quickly uh, to a broad uh, population, right? And uh, there's some uh, ev there's some uh, studies that have come out in the UK that have tried to predict the impact from a mortality rate uh, within the US and the UK, and those numbers are quite sobering. Uh, they estimated that uh, there could be 2.2 million deaths if we never did any measure to uh, curtail the spread of this virus uh, in the US alone. Right, and so uh, we've taken measures to not only cut that in half by their estimates down to 1.1, um, but certainly uh, there are studies to suggest that uh, we won't reach the, anywhere close to those numbers with the uh, drastic measures that have been instituted. Uh, and so the purple is depicting uh, how measures can blunt the total uh, spread of, of a particular uh, virus during a pandemic. And so to look at it in a different way, right, the reason why we say social distancing is by far and away the uh, um, means to limit spread uh, is, is based upon uh, personal contacts, okay? If you calculate um, the uh, susceptibility of a general population and the number of contacts that an individual or even a community would have in the general population, uh, that's called the secondary uh, hit rate, okay? And, and we, we can look at it uh, pictorially like this. Right? So let's say each square of uh, little um, uh, characters represents a community. And if we have one infected individual that travels only minimally through one community to the next, right, um, the growth of infection that you're seeing uh, represented by the highlighted uh, characters here uh, is exponential, meaning that um, day by day, uh, week by week, uh, there's a multiple, usually about 1.5 to 1.6 multiple of uh, uh, cases um, based upon that previous day's case. And so quickly in a short uh, amount of iterations, you can have infection of the entire uh, population. And so that's what we're trying to prevent with regard to social distancing and keeping people at home, working from home uh, when they can. So uh, in terms of uh, what to do, how we respond, um, we, we need to be very stern in terms of sticking to as best as possible these recommendations, right? Uh, for anybody, not just anybody at risk, right? For anybody in the general population, if you can work from home, the best practice is to work from home, okay? Um, limit personal meetings. Uh, there's, uh, there's a uh, kind of gradient, if you would, for those uh, numbers of limitations, right? In certain populations in general, it's 50 individuals, no larger than 50. In those communities that have sustained transmission, uh, it's no more than uh, five, two to five individuals, uh, particularly in the LA areas now uh, that are under um, uh, basically a shelter in place uh, order, right? And so uh, again, the general recommendation, best practice is if you can work from home, please work from home. Uh, if you have to go out, uh, then we want to make sure you're in, uh, not in a high risk uh, category, uh, elderly or underlying chronic disease. Uh, and obviously we want to practice uh, those uh, um, self uh, limiting contacts of six feet from individuals, et cetera, uh, social distancing. When we talk about travel considerations, obviously the travel bans have been in place um, and back in uh, on the 9th, China, Iran, Korea, Italy were on the map. Now it's a uh, larger list of countries. Um, but uh, at this point, most employers have limited non-essential, non-emergent business travel across the board. And that is continuing to be the best practice for now. Um, and then when we talk about 
what to pay attention to. It really is dependent on local county um, uh, levels, threat levels. And uh, we're all seeing the different uh, 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 counties and cities uh, institute uh, canceled schools, canceled uh, uh, events, and they're very appropriate. Uh, because again, the goal is to blunt the spread by limiting the number of contacts in the, any individual has. And uh, a good metric to kind of hold in your mind uh, is uh, something that we uh, take from our uh, um, chief medical director, Dr. Peter Greeny, who started Work Care. Uh, and his philosophy has always been during these pandemics, consider yourself uh, infectious and consider anyone you come in contact with infectious. And if you hold that, e you know, even if you're not in the high risk category per se, but if you have that high level of cautiousness, uh, then uh, we're more apt to pay attention to those things that help keep us safe, like hygiene and distancing. When we talk about screening recommendations, and we'll wind down here so we can take questions, uh, there's, uh, we, we try to keep it extremely simple, right, in terms of who's at risk and at what level. And so we, uh, consistent with CDC and WHO, have uh, uh, advised three buckets in general, high, medium, and low risk. What puts you in the high risk category if you have symptoms and you have exposure risk factors, meaning exposure risk factors, meaning you've had close contact uh, with an infected confirmed individual with COVID-19. Uh, and it, it, it does not mean that uh, that person is, has the sniffles, right? It means that that person has had a confirmed case, laboratory confirmed case of COVID-19. Uh, medium risk is uh, exposure, meaning you've had contact with a confirmed case, but you may or may not be symptomatic, right? So you, and so in those two scenarios, high and medium risk, you're to stay home and quarantine, self-quarantine, isolate for 14 days. Uh, again, going back to the incubation time period, uh, the 14 days is a safe period that uh, most, if not all people will experience symptoms so that we can appropriately uh, um, uh, ensure that you're safe to uh, return to whatever uh, emergent public uh, uh, setting or, or work setting um, you, you may be required to, to attend. Uh, if you're in the lowest category, that means that you uh, may have symptoms, you may have the sniffles, right? Um, but it is cold and flu season. So that is not few and far between in terms of who has the sniffles, but you don't have any exposure risk, meaning you don't have any contact with anybody uh, that has uh, had a suspected or confirmed case of COVID-19. But when we talk about exposure from a tertiary standpoint, right? Um, tertiary meaning that uh, the scenario is I've, uh, I, I'm in the household and my wife has contacted somebody with suspected COVID-19, what do you do, right? And so in that scenario, you're still low risk, right? Um, but the recommendation is if you can work from home, work from home. And that's the general recommendation for, again, everyone, no matter your risk level or no matter your location. Uh, are you at higher risk of contracting COVID-19 in that scenario? The answer is no, right? However, uh, if that individual, meaning your spouse or your housemate, develop symptoms, uh, then you must quarantine. Uh, we're recommending self-quarantine for 14 days. But it's only when that individual develops symptoms, uh, if they should develop symptoms, uh, that uh, that comes into play. So the uh, tertiary exposure risk, again, is called uh, this calculated from the secondary hit rate, for COVID-19, as we stand today, is less than 1%. And that's evidence and studies that have been shown that, again, even if I've, I've been in contact with somebody that's been in contact with somebody with uh, uh, confirmed COVID-19, my risk is less than 1% of contracting COVID-19. And so that's why it's not a, uh, a strong recommendation to um, uh, do a 14-day quarantine. When we address screening, I know a lot of employers uh, have moved towards doing infrared thermography. That is something that we have advised our, uh, obviously, clients about uh, and still do uh, today. But I want to give a, a mode of caution uh, to uh, the selection of these thermograph uh, thermographers or uh, in the two things to really pay attention to is uh, something called the DS ratio, distance to spot ratio, okay? And that just means that how far away can you measure somebody's temperature accurately? 
uh, and each device will have a different ratio. Um, most have either a 10 to one or a 12 to one ratio, meaning that I, if I wanna you know, look at someone's forehead on a one by one inch uh, uh, area, I need to be 12 feet uh, away or closer. Right, um, and that is the um, best thing to look forward uh, to when you're talking about doing the screening on individuals uh, and making sure you're getting uh, good uh, data. The other th consideration is the range, error range of that device. Each one, again, will have a different range. Uh, most of them that we've seen on the market have a range uh, of plus uh, or minus 2%, uh, as high as 5%. Um, of the degrees in Celsius and or Fahrenheit uh, and plus or minus either uh, two up, up to uh, five uh, degrees. And so again, if, you're, if you have a device that's plus or minus two degrees and you're trying to screen individuals that have a fever, 100.4, again, our normal fever, right, a 98.6, that plus or minus two degrees uh, can give you some false positives. Uh, and some false negatives. So pay attention to those. And again, we uh, help advise and, and help select in that regard uh, what thermometers uh, are best uh, suited for human uh, measurement. Again, none of these devices are FDA approved, except for one we've seen, but it's only the laser that's been FDA approved uh, to, to do uh, human uh, in, at the capacity that we're talking about. There, and these are specific to no touch. Um, that's important. When we are doing screening on site, we recommend strongly no touch devices to limit, again, person-to-person uh, -person contact and, and maximize social distancing. Uh, so with that, I'll stop there and we'll open up the questions. Uh, the, there are topics obviously we didn't cover today, but we are going to cover as we continue these series. We'll talk about uh, the, the uh, mental health effects uh, of dealing with coronavirus for your worker population and how to uh, appropriately respond and, and help those individuals. Uh, we'll talk more about other preventative strategies uh, and how we govern uh, staff and personal protective equipment, etc. Uh, but I'll open it up to questions at this point. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Harris. This is Karen O'Hara again. And um, we've run out our 30 minute time limit, but we're gonna take some questions now and then any we can't get to, we'll follow up for you in writing when we send out the recording. The first question is, if an employee becomes ill, what should be done for the coworkers who may have been exposed? Sure, so we'll define ill as uh, first, a confirmed case of coronavirus. So if that individual has a laboratory confirmed case of coronavirus, anyone who has worked within uh, six feet of that individual for 10 minutes or greater should be home for self-quarantine for 14 days. Uh, and that again is very granular data that we know uh, has been looked at and that is the litmus for close contact with an individual with confirmed disease. Now, if that individual is only under uh, suspicion, a PUI under investigation, uh, person uh, under investigation, uh, then again, th there's no requirement or a strong uh, requirement to send everyone home for 14 days, but best practice would be uh, go home at least for a period of uh, 24 to 48 hours uh, to see uh, if that individual who uh, is under investigation uh, being tested is going to uh, turn positive for coronavirus because there obviously is a window between when somebody may have symptoms to the point where they get uh, actually appropriately tested uh, for coronavirus. Okay, thank you. The next question is, is it possible to get COVID-19 more than once? Uh, the answer to that, um, by far and away, based upon the evidence, is no. Um, the, there are uh, one or two, I think three now that I've seen, uh, uh, reports, uh, not studies, but only reports in, in the media of uh, individuals who have uh, developed coronavirus infection, uh, were cleared, sent home, and then came back with either symptoms or another confirmed uh, test. In those scenarios, one of two things have likely happened. 
the person was discharged uh, in a, uh, too soon, meaning that they hadn't finished uh, the course of their infection and they uh, had recrudescence of symptoms, that symptoms came back, uh, and two, and or two, they had a, uh, a pulse, uh, either a false negative or a false positive test. And what I mean by that is before they were discharged, they likely had a test uh, performed that was negative and that precipitated their discharge. Uh, we know that there are a number of false negative tests. Uh, no test is 100%. There's also uh, the likelihood that when they came back for testing, uh, they had a false positive test uh, because of the uh, potential overreaction of the uh, particular enzymes uh, that uh, are used for the ELISA type test uh, to, to, de to detect coronavirus. And so, um, an immunity to this virus, just like with other viruses, means that you are by far and away safe and will not likely uh, contract coronavirus, uh, this particular strand of coronavirus again. Okay, hey, we'll take five more minutes of questions. The next one is relevant to those of our clients who do medical surveillance exams. Employees have expressed concern going to the clinic for their annual medical exams and baseline exams. Do you have any comments regarding this situation or precautions for employees who are going to get their exam? Yes, yeah, so CDC is, is now coming out with um, statements uh, as soon as today um, to uh, limit any non-essential uh, testing, right? And so uh, there, there's a letter that, uh, to be specific, uh, as example for DOT routine testing, uh, there's a letter that has come out from uh, and gone to FMCSA uh, from the president of uh, the American Occupational and Environmental Medicine uh, um, uh, uh, Society, and uh, they have asked to um, essentially uh, eliminate the need for the next 30 days for DOT drivers to go in for uh, their uh, annual or um, biannual testing. Um, because of the risk of exposure in the clinical setting. And that is a, a trend now that we're seeing with recommendations from uh, health departments to cancel uh, any non-elective surgeries, uh, to postpone any routine testing. Uh, and we've seen the um, CMS, the government, respond appropriately as well um, by creating new reimbursement codes um, that allows for telephonic care uh, to happen more fluidly from the provider to a patient, meaning that uh, there are codes now to allow clinicians to uh, continue to diagnose and treat chronic diseases uh, telephonically and reimburse as if the person had come in face-to-face. Uh, uh, -face. And so the push has been to postpone or delay any routine testing uh, unless it's, it's something that is either life-threatening or, or urgent um, uh, clinical situation. And you'll see uh, very likely, even by the end of this week, official statements coming out uh, to uh, limit uh, and, and not require uh, those things that have been required on a routine basis for our workforce, such as surveillance. Okay, thank you. Um, regarding bringing a subcontractor to a project site, should we give our subcontractors a questionnaire to determine if there is a risk of exposure? And does such a questionnaire exist? Uh, yes, uh, a questionnaire does exist. Uh, and the answer is, if, if there's an opportunity to administer a questionnaire that does not uh, uh, cause a undue burden from a business standpoint, then our, our uh, suggestion is absolutely give the questionnaire. Uh, we've developed an electronic questionnaire. Um, and uh, there's development of an app-based questionnaire that someone could pull up on their phone, right? Uh, so these are things that uh, take moments to, to do and it is uh, available so that you have an initial pre-screen uh, that then can triage that individual appropriately. And that's the goal, right? And obviously that contractor likely has to show up for work, right? They can't work remotely. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm presuming is this scenario um, because beyond that, um, the recommendation is to work remotely if they can. But in those situations where business has to continue, people need to show up, providing that screening questionnaire does exist and uh, is best practice to provide uh, as appropriate. Okay, two more questions. Um, how does the 
uh, COVID-19 virus affect smokers compared to non-smokers? Yeah, so there's not been any prospective studies to look at the impact uh, of smokers, um, particularly to COVID-19. However, we do know that underlying lung disease does increase your risk for developing pneumonias in general, particularly from infection. And so it likely follows that COVID-19, if you do have underlying uh, lung changes as a result of smoking, will put you in a category of higher risk uh, as a result. Uh, and, and so there's been no, again, uh, specific numbers in terms of absolute risk or even relative risk. Um, those studies are likely forthcoming, um, but as, as far as we know, there is increased risk if you are a smoker. And, and it also depends on your, your pack year history, right? A 20 pack year smoker versus a two pack year smoker would likely have a greater risk from coronavirus impact um, than that of someone who's only been smoking a pack a day for two years. Okay. Um, unfortunately, we only have time for one more question, but we will address all your questions in writing following the webinar, and we'll be publishing a frequently asked questions document for everyone. The, the last question has to do with um, the potential for infection transmission from surface contact. And you did mention some of the data in your um, presentation. I was wondering too about a um, couple people have asked me about money, and I read an article about how um, other coronaviruses have been studied for transmission on dollar bills or mm -hmm. money pay. Indeed. So uh, each of those uh, surfaces, um, whether it's money, whether it's uh, coins, whether it's uh, a doorknob or even you know an elevator button all are considered fomites. Uh, and a fomite is a potential for infection um, due to contamination uh, by the virus, right? Uh, and so it's clear that on those surfaces, uh, the virus can exist for prolonged periods of time, anywhere from hours to days. And so the, 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 the risk is only obviated uh, or removed if you're appropriately disinfecting, uh, whether again, that's money or otherwise. And so it is recommended to, and that's why the recommendation is to uh, do hand hygiene as frequent as possible. So even if you're handling you know, money from a cashier, uh, do make sure you have on you, you know, the appropriate hand sanitizer with alcohol, 60% um, or higher content, uh, and uh, do whenever you can wash your hands with uh, soap and water for 20 seconds. The rate of infection has not been studied from money particularly, um, but again, uh, it, it is known that all these fomites do pose a, a risk for infection. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Harris. We really appreciate your expertise today and wish we had more time, but in the interest of protecting everyone's time, we're gonna conclude the session for today, but please join us again next week at the same time on the same day, Wednesday, for a, a follow-up. Um, next week, um, Dr. Harris mentioned some of the subjects he intends to cover, and we'll probably also be discussing some aspects of social distancing and mental health issues associated with the pandemic. So thanks again for joining us, everyone. Please send us your questions to Alexis, and then we'll also be collecting the ones that have been submitted via the webinar chat. Thanks, Be everyone. safe and the rest of your day. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.